Hey, what's going on guys? It's Dr. Price with Action Potential Mentoring. I am post-op day three of my knee surgery, and tonight's my first night off of call since surgery, and the last two nights have been crazy. We've been operating till between 12 at night to 4 a.m., so first night off of call, first free night since surgery, and we are going to start it off by hitting endocrine high yields. So, First things first, let's talk about some of the really high yield diabetes medications. So if there's a patient that wants to lose some weight and also control their blood glucose at the same time, what you want to do is consider a GLP-1 agonist. And you could try exenatide or liraglutide, but you have to know the high, real, high yield side effect that is really, really tested for these, and that's pancreatitis. So. An important note is that guidelines will recommend adding insulin to patients that are just taking metformin if they have type 2 diabetes with a hemoglobin A1C greater than 8.5. So be careful if it's a patient that's on monotherapy with metformin, even if they're overweight, if their hemoglobin A1C is over 8.5, your next best step is going to actually be insulin rather than giving something like a GLP-1 agonist. So if their A1C is less than 8.5 and you want to control their weight and their blood glucose simultaneously, exenatide or liraglutide can help a lot. But if they're over 8.5, they're already on metformin, the next best step is going to be to add insulin. All right, let's do a lot, little bit of thyroid here. Somebody has thyrotoxicosis with a high radioactive iodine uptake. Your differential includes Graves, toxic multinodular goiter, as well as toxic nodules. If they have thyrotoxicosis with a low RIU, then you should be thinking painless or silent thyroiditis, subacute de Quervain thyroiditis, amiodarone-induced thyroiditis, excessive thyroid hormone intake, struma ovarii, and then iodine-induced thyrotoxicosis. So if you look at all these, you can kind of separate them in your head because the high RIU is essentially gonna be a Graves or a goiter for most questions, whereas if the low RIU patients come in, you're looking for something that's a thyroiditis for the most part. So that includes, like we said, the silent thyroiditis, the quervain thyroiditis, amiodarone thyroiditis, and then the other odds and ends are excessive intake, which would basically lower your body's amount of radioactive iodine uptake into the thyroid hormone because you're just exogenously taking it. And then struma ovarii. Remember, that's the ectopic thyroid hormone producing tumor. Important note that I want to mention here because it's tested so much is that subacute de Quervain thyroiditis, the treatment is going to be NSAIDs. And if NSAIDs fail, then you can try steroids. And this is going to present as a painful tender goiter after an upper respiratory tract infection. So you got to know the RIUs. So if it's high RIU versus low RIU and what your differential is, you can cross off at least three or four answer choices on every question for thyroids as long as you're able to keep your differential locked in. All right, this next one is a very high yield fact. I forgot it, but I don't want you guys to. So diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA, has depleted total body potassium stores. And so I completely forgot this. I felt dumb when I missed it, but I thought potassium stores were only depleted once you began treatment with insulin, but that's not actually true. Very, very far from the truth. So these DKA patients, even if they have hyperkalemia, their total body potassium levels are actually depleted. So make sure you know that. Let's talk about the treatment of DKA and HHS. So remember, DKA is with type 1 diabetes, HHS with type 2 diabetes. And so if the potassium is less than 3.3, in general, you're going to hold the insulin. If their potassium is less than 5.2, you need to actually add IV potassium. If their bicarb is... If their pH is less than 6.9, then you want to give bicarb. And if their phosphate levels are less than 1, you want to give phosphate. And also something to keep in mind is that low phosphate levels can cause cardiac dysfunction or respiratory depression. So if they have either one of those, you want to consider adding phosphate as well. You want to give normal saline to these patients, and you can add dextrose 5% when their serum glucose is less than 200. Certain textbooks and guidelines will actually say different types of fluid to give during DKA or HHS, but this is what UWorld gives you for the guidelines. So I'm just gonna share with you guys what UWorld says. So give normal saline and then add the dextrose 5% saline when their serum glucose is less than 200. You wanna start with IV insulin and you only switch to sub-Q insulin for the following. The patient's able to eat, their glucose is less than 200, 
their anion gap has normalized to less than 12, and their bicarb is greater than 15. So basically, when the patient starts getting back to a normalized status is when you switch them off the IV insulin and start giving them the sub-Q insulin. And you want to overlap the sub-Q insulin and the IV insulin by one to two hours. That's high yield for step three. They do like to test that more so on step three. But these are kind of the overarching exceptions and rules to the treatment of DK and HHS. So obviously, you want to give them fluids. So the patients get normal saline. And then if they get hypoglycemic, you add the D5. You want to give these patients insulin unless their potassium's so low, it's less than 3.3, that you're at a risk of a dangerous arrhythmia. And if their potassium is actually showing up to be less than 5.2, you want to add IV potassium. And again, if they're super acidotic, a pH of less than 6.9, you add the bicarb. And those are really going to be the major clues to help you get these questions right. For step three, like we said, whenever you're transitioning from IV insulin to sub-Q insulin, you want to have an overlap of one to two hours. All right, moving on. Graves disease can be associated with decreased extraocular movement. So these patients can have diplopia with movement of their eyes. So this patient in the question stem had diplopia with upward vision, and that threw me completely off. I did not know that that was something that Graves could present as. And I actually thought I was talking about Paranod syndrome, which can present exactly like this with diplopia of upward vision. But use your whole context clues to help clue you in. If they start giving you stuff such as weight loss, tachycardia, and then the diplopia, you're going to lean more towards Graves because you have those other hyperthyroid type symptoms. If the patient has true exophthalmos with impaired extraocular movement, that's basically only going to be in Graves disease. So for the USMLE, if you see that, you should be thinking Graves disease, the glycosaminoglycan deposition behind your eye can cause exophthalmos and can impair your extraocular movement. All right, let's talk about Gaucher's disease. So you get really, really severe splenomegaly and hepatomegaly. So these patients will have an abdominal exam that reflects that. So right upper quadrant and left upper quadrant are going to have mass feeling underneath palpation. These patients can present with anemia and thrombocytopenia. Their bone marrow is not doing what it should be. So you get actual bone pain because of the marrow infiltration. And again, that's kind of what results in the anemia and thrombocytopenia. These patients will have failure to thrive. So oftentimes the question stem will give you a delayed puberty or they'll have a very low height and weight percentile. And the treatment here is to actually replace glucocerebrosidase. So again, that's Gaucher's disease. You want to replace glucocerebrosidase to treat them. All right, next session we will pick up with Crohn's disease.